Another potential transfer? Oregon's looking at one. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Oregon baseball back to the super regional. So many thoughts. Kevin Sider. Oh boy. Oh boy. Got to talk about that and a bold prediction on one Mateo Uyunglele that I'll react to here on the show. But first things first, Oregon might not be done in the transfer portal. So over at uh, Scoop Duck, Max Torres reporting that uh, Bryce Foster will be visiting Oregon this weekend. Who might that be, Spencer? I shall tell you. Foster has been the starting center for the last couple of years for Texas A&M. Center, as in offensive line. He's been in the transfer portal for a hot minute. He entered on April 24th, which means he put his name in the transfer portal for the spring window. And he's been in there for over a month. Just goes to show you that you don't always have a destination lined up. Not everybody's been tampered with, but a lot of kids, of course, uh, have been, of course. And I really uh, am not that bothered by it. But he was on the all-freshman team in the SEC back in 2021. Going into 2024, he will be a redshirt junior when he takes the field. He's 6'5", 325 pounds, did have a knee injury in 2022 after starting the first four games, but... This is a guy who has started 24 games at center per the Texas A&M website. So that begs the question, why would Oregon look at a guy who is a starting caliber player? Do they not feel good about Poncho at center? The center quarterback exchange was not a uh, seamless, harmonious symphony in the spring game. It's also just a spring game, and you're rotating centers and quarterbacks around pretty often. And Poncho played center in the Fiesta Bowl, no problems. That was with Bo Nix. Maybe it's different with Dylan Gabriel. I think this guy would probably come in and be a backup center because right now the the depth chart for Oregon along the offensive line I think is solid. I don't think it's as strong as some of the other position groups, but I think the O-line depth has got the ability to withstand an injury or two and and still be all right, depending on the the position you're talking about. I think particularly on the interior, you've got guys like Dave Uli and Nishad Strother who have real game playing experience that could back up either of the guards who, if, if they were to go down with an injury, Matthew Bedford or Marcus Harper. But right now at the center position, you kind of have, if you were to put together a two deep, of course, the Oregon coaches ha- have not uh, done such a thing at this time. The backup center would probably be Marcus Harper if, if, if Poncho got hurt. And then you would have to slide uh, Davey Uli in, Harper over. Like the, the, the bottom line, and the Austin Audible guys did a good job talking about this not that long ago on, on, on an episode. Charlie Pickard is a walk on. And he comes up on the depth chart pretty quickly. So that's that's the angle where it makes sense is you're looking for a guy with power five starting. I'm not going to get used to saying power four for a while, but, you know, when he was playing, it was still the power five. You've got a guy with power five starting experience. He started a couple dozen games at the center position. And look, Oregon's brought in offensive linemen over the last couple of years that started elsewhere. And came in and didn't play. Nishad Stroder, a great example. Now, he had an injury component as well. Even when he got back healthy, though, look at Junior Angilau, who came in from Texas. I think a lot of people, I think I might even have had Angilau as someone who was going to come in and start at guard for Oregon. And he did not. It was Stephen Jones and it was Marcus Harper. And Harper has held that left guard position for the last several seasons now. He's not a dominant run blocker. He is an Excellent, excellent pass blocker, though, according to Pro Football Focus. And I expect him to keep that position. And you bring in a sixth-year senior in Matthew Bedford, 
who, you know, physically and experience wise is essentially a replacement for Steven Jones from a year ago. Can't imagine he's not starting. And then last year, Davey Uli was the seventh offensive lineman that Oregon used. You had the first five, you know, JPJ, Jones, Harper, and then Cornelius and Connerly at tackle. Poncho was the sixth who would rotate in at guard and, you know, center if JPJ had to come out of the game. And then you had uh, Davey Uli who went in if there was another need. And Uli, by all accounts, did a good job. Didn't have a huge snap count, but did well in, in the snaps that he was on the field. So that's a former blue chip offensive line recruit, uh, Davey Uli. So no, no surprise, like that's why he was recruited to Oregon. So I, I think that this... This is an interesting name to hear pop up, Bryce Foster from Texas A&M. Clearly, there's plenty of potential. You make the SEC all-freshman team, especially in the trenches, you, you got to showcase the potential. I don't know if he's been the same since he got injured back in 2022, and it, and it appears that he's battled injuries over, over the last couple of seasons, which could also make it make sense for him to come to Oregon because if a starting workload is – regularly ending up with him getting hurt and not playing a full season, well, then what sort of situation would you be looking for if you're Bryce Foster? You'd be looking for a backup role, an opportunity where, hey, if you need me, I can play, know what I'm doing here, played center before at the highest level of college football in the SEC, but also I'm not looking to start. Like that. That's, that's the curious thing, though, is – you know, the, the intel on on this guy is that, you know, Oregon is in a really, really good spot and almost expects to get him. It's not a done deal. It has not happened yet. But if you're someone who's started over the course of several seasons for Texas A&M at center, why would you be looking at going to be a backup somewhere else? I don't know. I, like, it's slightly different with the Nishad Strother situation, even if he'd been healthy, I don't think he starts at guard last year, even though he started at East Carolina and was like their highest graded offensive lineman the season prior. That's going from the American Conference to formerly the Pac-12 RIP. And it's a bigger school. It's a bigger opportunity. Like that might have had to do as much with off field stuff and opportunities as on field. I, I don't know. I don't know all the details of that. That's just me wildly speculating. But for for Foster, it would be not not a move I, I I'd expect because I think the offensive line depth is okay. But if there was one spot where you'd say, mm, not sure about how how the two deep rotation works there, and if it's as strong as the other ones, center would be that position. So if he's comfortable coming in and you know either trying to push Poncho for the starting center spot or he's okay backing him up, then yeah, this could absolutely work. But uh, it caught my eye, hence why I'm talking about it. Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments below or hit me up on X, formerly known as Twitter. Lots of ways to get in the mailbag, as always. And one of you came in with a scorching hot take that I'm going to address. And I love the energy. I just don't happen to agree. That's coming up next. This episode is brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. That's why two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, little second segment sip to keep us going. As always, everydayers on YouTube, who I very much appreciate, and on podcasts, those watching, though, can probably remember or recognize back in my usual setup in Utah for a week, and then I'll be back in Oregon. So and I am excited to be back there for uh, several reasons. Okay, let's talk about Mateo Uyunglele. 
Mailbag is always open. YouTube comments, X formerly known as Twitter. If you want priority access and all sorts of other perks, go join the flock over at Subtext. That link in the description below, wherever you listen to or watch the show. Free 14-day trial. Then it's just $5 a month. Not a requirement, though. But it is an advantage to be sure if you want to be a Locked On Ducks insider. Pop candidates is something I talked about last week on the show, and I asked you to submit yours. Who do you think is going to pop? Now, a pop candidate is someone who was on the team last year, didn't have too big of a role, or could just have a much bigger role this year. One of you picked Mateo Uyunglele. I have always been a big Mateo fan. Hard to not be. Big time recruit coming out of high school. Played as a true freshman. Made an impact. Good football player. Jonathan, I, I respect the boldness here, Jonathan. If I were to fully emulate Josh Pate, this would be a 9.75 on Josh Pate's boldness scale. Jonathan thinks Mateo Uyunglele is going to get 12 sacks this year. Okay, that's a lot of sacks. Now, I am exceedingly high on Oregon's defensive line. Mateo is a reason why. He's not the only reason why. And I'll give you a few reasons why he's not getting 12 sacks this year. Could he be more productive than last year? Yes. He went down for just two sacks. Should have been three because, you know, the Texas Tech one, they called a penalty, but Mateo had the sack. So he had three sacks essentially last year, made a bunch of plays in the run game as well. The last time an Oregon football player hit double-digit sacks was 2015. DeForest Buckner had 10 and a half sacks, and he was the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year. Double-digit sack seasons are exceedingly difficult to come by. For reference, this past year, the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year, RIP, was Liatu Latu, first-round pick of the Indianapolis Colts, one of the most dominant defensive ends we, we saw in, in that league ever. That, that guy was freakishly good. If I were to make an all-decade Pac-12 defense, Kayvon Thibodeau would be one defensive end and Latu would be the other because I have not seen two guys that impact the game more than those two individually. So getting double-digit sacks, Oregon has not seen that in once this year starts. It will have been nine years since that last took place. And you go back into the, the history books a little bit, it doesn't happen very often at all, at least not in the modern era of Oregon football, 2010 and beyond. So prior to Defoe in 2015, the last double-digit sack season was Kenny Rowe, great speed rusher. He had 11 and a half in 2009. He was actually the third of three straight double-digit sack seasons from players coming off that defensive end position. Nick Reed, there's a throwback name who I remember watching as a kid. I'm sure many of you do as well. Maybe not as a kid, but you might remember him. He had 13 in 2008 and 12 in 2007, which is pretty, which is pretty nuts. So the last two years, Oregon sack leaders have been Dorless this past year with five, DJ Johnson the year prior with six, and then Kayvon Thibodeau in 2021, he had seven, and his freshman year, he had nine, which is a crazy number. That's a that's a crazy stat for a true a true freshman to just step into the Pac-12, help Oregon win the Pac-12, and have nine sacks in that season. Crazy. Don't know if we will see that again, because Kayvon was a freak, as we all know, and he's very good in the NFL. So why have those numbers been so low? I think it's partially a product of Oregon's recruiting stepping up its game. And when you watch what Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoi and the rest of the defensive coaches do along that defensive line, they rotate guys a lot. If you look at the snap counts, defensive backs over the course of a season last year for, for Oregon will log in like the six to 700 range. Defensive linemen are more like three to 400. And certainly, you know, it's not unique to Oregon. I haven't looked at every other team. But Dan Lanning likes to rotate guys to keep them fresh because you're working incredibly hard on every single snap. And you only do that if you feel like you have the personnel to not drop off from one line change to the next one. So I think Oregon's got that because 
I love this defensive line. I think this is the best D-line Oregon's had since that 2014 season when you had DeForest Buckner and Eric Armstead, which to this day is still probably the best D-line uh, I- I've seen Oregon football have. I know Haloti Nada is probably the best individual player along the defensive line, but those two guys were both top 10 NFL draft picks. This Oregon D-line is great. They don't have two top 10 NFL draft picks. So, I I think that getting to 12 sacks is an incredibly bold take. And I expect Mateo to be good. I have high hopes for him. I think maybe not this year, but maybe next year, he's an all-conference performer and could have a high single-digit sack season where he racks up seven, eight, or nine. Getting to 12, not going to happen. Not just because of you know his, his youth. He's going into his true sophomore campaign. Certainly, I expect him to make a sophomore jump. But there are just other guys that are going to be getting after the quarterback. Like You're just not going to have the opportunity to rush the passer that often. And certainly Mateo is talented enough and big enough to be that sort of guy. I just don't see him being on the field all the time. And And by the way, this is a good thing. This is not an indictment of Mateo. This is not, you know, something bad about Oregon's defense. This is a great thing about Oregon's defense. There are a lot of defenses. I think there have been Oregon defensive lines, frankly. You know, you look at like the early Cristobal years of the Taggart, ta- uh, the, the Willie Taggart team, the last Helfrich team. If a guy as talented as Mateo was on the team, he'd barely be able to come off the field. But now he's one of several guys that's working into the rotation. So 12 sacks. I respect the bold claim. I, I respect it. I just don't see it because... You know, he and Tatum Tuioti and Blake Purchase, those guys are studs. They're all studs. And, you know, which guy you want to put on the field? I I think Oregon's versatility along the defensive line is high level. I think you can have some really, really fun pass rush packages where you have Jordan Birch as the biggest guy, and you put those three on the field. Or put Elijah Rushing out there. You know, see what uh, Amarion Winston brings to the table. Like, I I, I just, I am so high on, on that defensive line. But... I love it. And uh, by the way, Jonathan was not the only, only one who picked Mateo as a pop candidate. I think it's a reasonable selection. I don't know about 12 sacks, though. I think that's a bit much. Another one that, uh, that came in was Jaden Lamar. So Jaden Lamar, four-star true freshman a year ago, I, I believe redshirted. And going into this year, he's third on the depth chart? I think. Maybe. I'll get to that in a sec. Last year, he had 24 carries for 113 yards and, and one touchdown, which was mostly mop-up duty. I mean, the only meaningful snaps he played were in the Fiesta Bowl. You know, he was lead blocker on that Bucky Irving third and eight sweep where he pancaked two guys. It was awesome. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely awesome. He could have a bigger role this year. It's hard to play running back as a true freshman. The Royce Freemans, Thomas Tyners of the world, the Michael James, that's not that common. I mean, at Oregon, it's you know sounds a little bit more common, but that's a difficult thing to do. In 2022, when Oregon had a fully healthy assortment of running backs to hand the ball to. Sean Dollars and Jordan James both had exactly 194 rushing yards each, which is more than Lamar had a year ago. Like once Whittington went down, it was a two-headed backfield. I think you will see some semblance of a three-headed backfield. I just wonder what sort of personnel packages Jaden Lamar would be in for and where he is on the depth chart. I mean, Jay Harris looked awesome d2 all-american in northwest missouri state he's got the size and you're just wondering okay can he run at the division one level yeah he was bowling over granted kamar mathuri is a true freshman but i mean even non-true freshmen were struggling to get him to the ground so if you're talking about you know a 21 personnel package you know two backs one tight end and going you know back to that which i loved i thought oregon had great success with it i'd love to see him bring that back Maybe you'd put Lamar and Harris out there and spell both Jordan James and Noah Whittington. I don't know. I'd expect Jaden Lamar to have more yards than he did a year ago, 113. I'd be surprised if it goes over 300. I mean, if he gets over 200, that would be, you know, a a first in which you'd have three running backs over 200 yards in a, a given season. But If you have more pop candidates that you want me to talk about here on the show, I've got some other ones that uh, I'll get to as the week goes on. Let me know. Drop drop your thoughts. Drop me a note. DM, subtext, however. (sighs) Oregon baseball is super, super, 
Super. And we're going to talk about Super Kevin Sider coming up next. Have I ever told you how Super FanDuel is? Well, if I have, it bears repeating. It's winner take all time in the NBA and the NHL playoffs are in full force. And FanDuel is giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to bet on spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Oregon's win total is up there at 10 and a half. You can bet individual games, just Oregon plus one and a half against Ohio State. Give me the ducks on that one. Every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Getting points at home. I love it. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every playoff shot count. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book and our official sports book sponsor here at the Locked On Network. Oh, hi. For those watching on YouTube, this is a broom. I don't have an actual broom for those listening on podcasts, but I am... I'm, I'm sweeping. I'm sweeping because Oregon baseball came through with the sweep in the Santa Barbara Regional. This is a UC Santa Barbara team that earlier in the year came into PK Park and was the only team to walk out of that park with a series victory. They took two of three. You knew it was going to be tough and it wasn't easy, but Kevin Sider is superhuman. Now, I'm going to shout out a number of people. Certainly not every person who made a big player had a big moment. It was great to see Jacob Walsh hit a home run. The pitching that I've talked about all season long when I've discussed baseball here on the show. And by the way, got to shout out Jared Mack because when he came on and baseball was just kind of getting underway and was looking at the season, he said very clearly and was 1,000% right that this is a different level pitching staff than what Oregon's had in the past. And this could not be more true because Kevin Sider just threw a 125 or 126 pitch complete game shutout against the 14th ranked team in all of college baseball on the road. And guess what? The day before against UC Santa Barbara, Grayson Grinsell was magnificent. The fact that the pitching staff against the Gauchos who have had great pitchers as well, are more known for that than hitting, but still they got some dudes that can swing the bat. In the last two games against the Gauchos, a perennial top 25 team and program every year and all throughout this season, allowed one run in 18 innings is crazy good. I'm a Seattle Mariners fan. I am accustomed to to watching high-level pitching. We have the best pitching staff in all of baseball up there at the major league level. So these games were incredibly familiar from a feeling standpoint for me. But for Oregon, this was different. They did not win games like this. Last year, they didn't do it the year prior. It just wasn't in the cards. Kevin Sider is the number three starter. He's the Sunday guy. It's R.J. Gordon first, it's Grayson Grinsell second, it's Kevin Sider third, and boom, boom, boom. Mark Wozikowski rolls him out there. There was a questionable decision in R.J. Gordon's start. I, I, I was okay sending Gordon out there for the eighth at 108 pitches in that game against San Diego, but he needed to be on a one base runner and yank situation. And Woz let him put two on, Brought in Brock Moore, three-run homer, but Oregon wins the game because Bryce Betcher is a hero. So they won game one against San Diego, 5-4 and 11 innings on Bryce Betcher's uh, go-ahead homer in the top of the 11th. Then they're the home team for the next two games, which I didn't fully understand, but all right, whatever works. In game two, oh man. I, that, that, I mean, that was just a crazy game. That was a crazy game. Oregon was up 1-0 going into, I don't know why this is soccer all of a sudden, but whatever. 1-0 going into the bottom of the eighth. They scrap across an insurance run. Shout out to Jack Brooks, the pinch runner. Read a chopper that got over the pitcher's head, bolted for home and scored, and Oregon won the game 2-1. to one. The uh, freshman, Ryan Featherston, closed that game out. And, I mean, I mean Maddox Maloney had a big defensive play. Grayson Grinzel tossed seven scoreless. And look, coming into this game, I thought Oregon was going to need more than, than three runs. Kevin Siders had his, has had his moments this year. That was the moment of the year for Kevin Sider. He 
was magnificent. His efficiency until the last, really just the last inning in the ninth was remarkable. He was at 83 pitches going into the eighth. Pretty sure he was under 100 going into the ninth, and then he had to labor a little bit. Got one guy down to the final strike, and he singled. Got the next guy down to the final strike, and he singled. Then he was down 2-0 to the next guy, who's the tying run at the plate, and it hit a home run in this regional, and he struck him out on pitch number, I think it was 126. You want to talk about grit, gut, determination. You ever thrown 120 pitches in a game? When I was in Little League, there was a pitch limit. We all had the pitch limit. And when I, I mean, I, I pitched all the time in, in Little League, but in uh, American League, at least where I'm from, that's what we called it, the pitch limit was 85. And after 85 pitches, I felt all right. This was a Little League mound as a kid throwing, eh, not that hard. I was about location and off-speed stuff. After 85 pitches, I was okay, but I didn't want to pitch the next day. I could have thrown 100. 126 pitches? Dude, that's 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 some... For those listening on podcasts, I'm doing some big balls chip here because that's what that was. You got to have some cojones to just muster up the intestinal fortitude to, to run on adrenaline. Final pitch was a high fastball, struck the guy out, and Oregon goes 3-0 and in the Santa Barbara Regional. Remember, going into this regional where Santa Barbara was hosting, they're the favorite. They're playing on their home field. They had won 14 consecutive games. San Diego, Oregon's first opponent, had won 10 consecutive games. And Oregon went 3-0 against those teams after going 0-2 in the Pac-12 tournament. As I said going into the regional, it's baseball, man. It can be random and weird and not play out the way it should on paper. Because on paper, Oregon shouldn't have won these games, but guess what? They won them, and they're going back to the Super Regional. Do not know yet because the Supers are not all set if Oregon's hosting. I really hope they do for two reasons. Number one, they had awesome support last year. PK Park was electric. And number two, I'm going to be back in Oregon this weekend and I could go to the games. <laughs> that would be great. So I, I don't know it's a guarantee. I know Oregon was, I think, the lowest ranked in terms of RPI at-large team to get into the regionals, but they proved that they belong. And for them to win in this fashion, three straight games where the pitching is just dynamite. RJ Gordon and Logan Mercado game one. Grayson Grinsell in game two and Ryan Featherston finishing the job. And then Kevin Sider, bullpen tired. Mercado not, not ready. I'm good. I'll just, I'll just run it all the way through. That was awesome. That was awesome. I hope that everybody out there recognizes how strong this program is becoming. Back-to-back -back Super Regionals, that's the equivalent of going to back-to-back -back Sweet 16s. That's, that's, that, that, that's what it is. Because uh, Omaha is, I think, the final eight. But you know, getting past Regionals is, I don't know if the exact numbers line up, but it's the, it's the equivalent of getting, getting to the second weekend of March Madness which Dana Altman very nearly did this year. Should have done, as a matter of fact. But we need not go back down that rabbit hole because Oregon's got a chance. And I say going into the regional. Oregon's 75-1 to 1 to win the College World Series. Of course they could. It's baseball. You've got Arizona losing to Dallas Baptist. you got Vanderbilt, a national power in baseball, getting eliminated by high point. you got GCU beat, like, it's baseball. Tennessee is the best team in college baseball they have been all year. But I don't know. If you got pitching, you can always make it interesting. When your starters are giving you a chance. And, you know, my, my biggest keys going into the regional were the starters have got to go at least five innings. <laughs> they all went at least seven. Yeah, that, so let's let's check that box off. And then what was my other my other key? That the, the, the bats needed to not, like, win the game. But they needed to heat up 
a little. And they've kind of done that. They've, they've kind of done that. Maddox Maloney got robbed of a home run. It was a heck of a play by the Santa Barbara left fielder. I mean, I mean a heck of a play. Or else this is a 5 nothing victory. Still... Not scoring more than five runs in any of the last five games that Oregon's played, dating back to the Pac-12 tournament. That's strange. It's out of the ordinary. But that's what this team is. It's pitching, and holy crap, can they play defense. Carter Garotti plays a nasty third base. Maddox Maloney at short is filthy, and Bryce Betcher should have been the defensive player of the year. And and whether you got Bennett, Thompson, or not, uh, not Arrows, um, Whoever the other uh, catcher is, I'm, I'm forgetting who the, the second catcher is right now, but like they've been great keeping the ball in front, throwing a guy out from time to time. Like I, I have been really impressed with how they play defense, but the pitching, pitching gets, gets all the love here. Like the bats did enough. They manufactured runs. They stole bases. They bunted. They moved guys along. They had some timely hits. This was all about the pitching. RJ Gordon, Grayson Grinzel, and Kevin freaking cider those dudes were dealing and i mean dealing in their three starts and when you've got guys feeling that good against that caliber of competition you never know what could happen so hopefully the games are at pk park we'll see we'll see where it falls but i was stoked to see it i hope you are as well because mark wazikowski is building something here and it looks really really good Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.